Hi everybody, it's Chris, and welcome to another video by the Infinity System. This time up, we have our review of Episode 4 of Moon Knight. How is Marvel doing with the representation of DID so far? We'll let you know, and boy, what a trip down the rabbit hole this one was. Uh, first, we'd like to take an opportunity to thank all of our new viewers and subscribers who have found us through these review videos and might not be familiar with uh, our content. Please be aware that we do address very heavy and sub-triggering subjects here on the channel, including trauma, and that we do place trigger warnings on them. We don't place them lightly. We expect you to practice viewer discretion. And when we advise it, it's for a good reason. With that said, let's go ahead and move on to our review. And for those of you who haven't watched the other ones, we'll refresh you on our rating system. Based on the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead, we have come up with a scale for weighing the heart or a negative representation of DID versus a feather of truth or a positive representation of DID. At the end of the episode review, we'll go ahead and tally up the totals and we'll see where the representation scale lies, good or bad. So far, we've been leaning much towards the positive side, so let's hope that episode four continues that trend. Basically, the episode is review until about the two-minute mark where we see the statuette of Kanchu being taken into the Great Pyramid and put into a niche with at least ten other gods. At around the three-minute mark, Layla desperately tries to wake up Stephen and Mark, who have fallen unconscious due to the withdrawal of Kanchu's power as he was turned to stone. And, of course, with typically terrible bad timing and the fact that it was written in the script, Amut's followers show up. A nonsensical action sequence occurs, and Layla rolls herself and Stephen down a sand dune hill in order to get away momentarily. Shades of the Princess Bride, anyone? Pursuing a rolling Stephen and Layla down the hill, the bad guys then inexplicably stay in their truck and not get out of it in order to check the truck that Layla has now crawled into. Layla finds and lights a flare to distract the bad guys in Jurassic Park style, and the bad guys then use their truck to attack rather than just shooting her from on foot. Bad guy logic. What you gonna do? At the five-minute mark, raining fire from the mounted 50 caliber machine gun on the truck, Layla then bravely uses said flare as a distraction, and then, using Ned another one, throws it into a convenient ammo crate on the truck. You would think by now that bad guys would learn to cover up their ammunition, or perhaps not carry them in the back where they're standing. Go figure, bad guy logic. Uh, at this point, watching the collateral damage, Stephen has woken up and stands there looking at Layla's handlurk as she turns back and looks at him and says, What? You know, we're really starting to like Layla here. Okay, at around the six-minute mark, we have Layla and Stephen back in the truck and heading towards the tomb. Layla tells Stephen that when they get to the tomb, they're going to need Mark. In the side mirror, the only one remaining after Mark's temper tantrum in the last episode, Mark agrees, saying, see, she gets it. Stephen refuses to surrender the body, however, telling Layla about his previous agreement with Mark and that Mark would vanish after Khonshu's service was over. Being that Khonshu at this point has now vanished, one could conclude that, yeah, their service is over with. Mark, however, states that the deal didn't include getting Layla and us killed, did it? That's not going to fly with me. Uh, Layla, hearing this, then gets pissed at both of them, stating, So you just made a deal that you would just vanish from my life, and you don't think that I should be made aware of that. Uh, Stephen then replies, Logically, but perhaps not wisely, but hadn't he disappeared from your life already? Layla has to agree to this, and then bitterly states that the suit was his best feature anyway, and now he doesn't even have that anymore. Mark, obviously upset with this, demands that Stephen give him the body, stating that they're on a suicide mission and that they need him. Layla then states that, besides, I know him. He'd want to lone wolf this whole thing, and that's not happening. We're not going to do that. Again, asserting herself and being a positive, strong person, definitely. Stephen then agrees, stating that, we're not. It's just you and me in the open road choosing to ignore Mark completely. Upon which, Layla promptly stops the car and states that we'll walk on foot from here. 
this possibly symbolizes her anger with Mark and perhaps a desire to make Stephen work for her attentions. And, of course, it's a direct symbol of her refusal to put up with Mark's bullshit any longer. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and award Layla one feather of truth for addressing alters individually and treating the system as a whole, and one feather for a depiction of a realistic argument with your alters, and one feather for Layla again for showing her anger, but not taking it out on Steven, showing a differentiation between them as two true individuals. At about the seven minute mark, Layla and Steven begin walking down a mysterious canyon towards Amut's tomb and are greeted by a large goat standing over a natural rock arch over the path. Now, curiously, while this might seem to be insignificant, this could in fact be a direct reference and perhaps appearance of the Egyptian god Khnum, one of the most ancient gods in the Egyptian pantheon. Khnum was originally a water god who was thought to rule over all waters, including the rivers and lakes of the underworld. According to one creation myth, Khnum molded everything on his potter's wheel, including both the people and the other gods. At the eight minute mark, Layla and Stephen then move oh so stealthily through Harrow's dig site, finding that there's no one around. Okay, other than these two camels. After deciding to ransack the camp for supplies, wisely, Stephen and Layla then split up. Stephen enters one tent and, of course, ends up in conversation with Mark through the aegis of a convenient reflection on the table. Mark then tells Stephen, you look scared. Stephen replies, I'm not. Mark then tells him, well, you should be. Without Khonshu, there's no more suit, no more healing, and no more power. To which Stephen replies succinctly, yeah, and no more you, I thought. But that's what you said, isn't it? Just goes to show how believing anything you say makes me an idiot, doesn't it? Mark then states, Look, I wish I could just disappear. I really do. But unfortunately, I'm still here. And if you're going to go through with this, you have to be smart, at least for Layla's sake. I've been in situations like this before. Stephen then responds, Well, so have I. It's the same body, isn't it? So it's all in there somewhere. Muscle memory and all that. Mark rejoins with, yeah, I'm not sure it works that way, and Stephen then cuts him off with a whatever, clearly seeking to end the conversation. Mark then attempting to perhaps be compassionate, as irritation is not getting him anywhere with Stephen, states, I'm here, you're not alone. Stephen, however, rounds on him and states, I'm not alone, I know that, I've got Layla, she's got my back. Mark isn't happy with this. Oh, are you in love? In love with my wife? And then grows increasingly agitated, stating, You lay one finger on her, and I swear to you, Stephen, I'll throw us off a cliff. Stephen, having had more than enough, then states, Yeah, well, we'll call you if we need a protein shake or something. So, let's unpack this. We're going to award one feather for showing inter-system communication and active influence. We're going to award one feather for Mark stating that he wishes that he could just simply vanish. This speaks to a common feeling that is strongly connected to those who have experienced intense trauma. The need to disappear, the need to vanish, to make it all just go away. We're also going to award one feather to Mark for attempting to support Stephen with the not alone comment if it is belated. We're going to give one heart to Mark, however, for stating that he'll harm the body if Stephen doesn't stay away from Layla. Last, we're going to award one feather for showing how complicated relationships with NTs can be, i.e. the triangle of Stephen, Mark, and Layla, and how alters can disagree about these same persons and may have diametrically opposed feelings towards that person in their life, which is obviously not the case here, but still the point is valid. At the 10 minute mark, grabbing supplies in another tent, Layla doesn't seem to notice the blood and embalming tools that is all over the tent, all over the crates, laying there, obvious to anyone who might actually be paying attention. At 10.30, as the supplies are gathered, they're standing at the edge of the tomb and Layla puts a rope harness on Stephen. Stephen states that he's been waiting this whole life for this. Uh, the adventure, to which Layla smiles and says, I know. We're going to overlook the obvious, or we'll try to overlook the obvious sexual tension joke here, despite the blatant attempts to once again emphasize, or perhaps shoehorn, the growing attraction between Stephen and Layla. However, we can't continue to ignore it when Layla then states, 
You smell like him. I mean, why wouldn't you? The moment builds and Layla then leans in for a kiss. Stephen, to his credit, stops her by spilling Mark's secret. That Mark is trying to protect her by keeping her at arm's length because Kanchu wants her as his next avatar. Stephen, being a gentleman, tells her that he thought that she should know that. Which implies, before we go any farther, you and me. Layla asks, why are you telling me this now? Stephen states, I don't know. I just thought you deserved to know. Layla, then clearly frustrated, says, it wasn't his call to make. I don't need protection. I need honesty. Stephen then sighs and replies, yeah, I get that. Layla, still hooking him up to the repelling gear, states thoughtfully, that's more of the you thing, isn't it? A direct callback to her conversation on the boat with Mark. Stephen asks, that thing being honesty? And Layla says, yeah, being honesty. Stephen, seeing her pain and confusion and torn feelings, then, to his credit, seizes the moment and Layla and completes the kiss that she was leaning in for earlier. A bit breathless, Layla states that she's going to go down first and belay. But um bum And for the first time, Stephen catches on that they're going to be repelling and asks her, what's belay? And then Layla chuckles and says, I'm still not sure when you're joking or not. As Stephen then watches Layla descend into the tomb, Mark suddenly seizes control of one of the body's arms and promptly and swiftly punches Stephen in the nose. Wow, this is another one to unpack. We're going to award one feather for continuing to show the attraction between Layla and Stephen, and for Layla continuing to treat Stephen separately from Mark, able to make that mental leap that, yes, these are individual people in one body. We're going to award one feather for showing the confusion and weirdness those self-same NTs encounter when dealing with different alters in a body that they are familiar with. For example, in this case, the sense of smell. The body is still going to smell the same, despite the fact that there are different people living in it. We're going to award a double feather for Steven stopping Layla's initial kiss and telling her Mark's motivations for keeping her away. This shows twice with one set of actions that Steven is not only vastly different from Mark, but is also a true gentleman. Not only to Layla, but to Mark. He doesn't want to proceed with Layla unless there is a clean slate of honesty between them all, whether Mark likes it or not. Another feather for Stephen being willing to make that kiss happen after the revelation of Mark's intentions, not taking advantage here, but letting Layla know that he truly does deeply care for her. We'll leave out the fact that this kiss contains very little passion between the two actors. Curious, because they have no trouble making the chemistry work so far. It's just this seems, I don't know, awkward in some way to us. But last, one feather for showing Mark punching Stephen and the body in the nose. Now, while this is purely played for comedy, this can be realistic, and from our experience, we can testify to this, that if an alter wants to, they can actively influence the body and momentarily shove whoever it is that's fronting out of the way to take an action. Christopher has done this to us on several occasions. So, definitely, one feather there. At around the 12-minute mark, arriving at the bottom of the shaft, Layla then looks about, and Stephen suddenly comes tumbling head over heels down the shaft. Layla helps him up and begins to remove the harness, at which point Stephen states, Oh, wow, look at you. But <laughs> Layla quickly realizes that Stephen is in fact referring to a nearby set of statues and not her. Stephen again, at this point, geeks out a bit, stating, If they sprang to life right now and asked me a riddle, I'd be thrilled. I'd shit myself, but I'd be thrilled. Uh, Got to admit, we died there. That's just... Bravo. French kiss for you. At the 13-minute mark, Layla notes that her father would have loved being here and reveals to Stephen that he was an archaeologist on a mission and thought that it was a dream worth dying for. And he did. Stephen tells her, I bet he would be absolutely beaming right now, seeing you standing in the proof of it. Layla replies softly, Yeah, I think so obviously touched by Stephen's compassion. One feather for Stephen offering an honest and unsolicited compliment and empathy 
further, serving to differentiate between Stephen and Mark, and showing that different altars, again, can have different styles and difficulties with communication. As they proceed deeper into the tomb, Layla catches on to the fact that they are in a maze. As Stephen begins figuring out which path to take, Layla then spots high-power ammo shells on the floor and wonders what would they have been shooting at, cluing us into the fact that Harrow's men have met something ugly, and at this point, we know that we are eventually going to see it. At the 15-minute mark, Stephen reveals that the entire structure is based off of the Ujat, or Eye of Horus, and then explains what the various parts of the eye stand for. They both then notice that the eye he has drawn is now reflected in the ceiling of the tomb. Following the interpretation of the symbols Stephen provides, the two then proceed down the proper corridor, finally emerging in what is obviously, to anyone with half a brain who had seen the money with Brandon Fraser, a cenotaph where mummies were made. One feather for again showing that altars can have completely different skill sets and interests that can solve a problem that are not shared by other system members. Seeming to, for the moment anyway, completely and utterly miss this fact, Layla finds a hieroglyph of temple priests who, in true Hollywood fashion, seem to have been buried alive with the pharaoh, which is something that never actually happened. Moving on, finally noticing the blood-soaked platform in the middle of the room, which is complete with little chunks of meaty bits, which Stephen adroitly points out, Layla, looking under the slab, notices canopic jars, the jars that held the internal organs removed during the mummification process, but some are covered in fresh blood. Layla shakily states, let's keep moving, to which Stephen heartily agrees. He then, however, expresses some trepidation upon seeing the blood trail that they're following in the tunnel, and for once, stating the obvious, that maybe it isn't a great idea to follow where the bones and blood trail goes? Looking about the room for another exit and finding one, Stephen and Layla agree to check it out. Pulling himself up in the upper level, Mark discovers a wall mural that describes Amut's imprisonment inside of a new Shakti statue, as we've already seen with Khonshu and the other gods. Geeking out about a table whose contents would better belong in the dinner scene in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Layla advises Stephen that he needs to focus on finding the exit. Finding a way out, Stephen and Layla are startled by the sound of gunfire nearby. One feather here for showing how easily an altar, i.e. Stephen, can get sidetracked into one of their interests. This happens to us all the time. Someone will zero in on something, and then the next thing you know, it's a couple of hours later, and we have been assembling origami butterflies or something. So <laughs> this is realistic. At the 18 minute 30 second mark, Stephen and Layla begin to hear a nasty little wet clicking lilies. Ugh, no doubt made by the something ugly that had been foreshadowed a few minutes before and that Harrow's thugs have been firing at. Being a smart audience, we've already determined that the ugly sound is issuing from one of the priests entombed with the pharaoh. Layla and Stephen then hide, with Layla being trapped behind or under the slabs, our monster makes his appearance lugging one of Harrow's men, who is injured, but still alive, just for gruesomeness sake. The thug's living status rapidly begins to change as the undead priest begins to vivisect him, removing his organs one at a time, much to the dismay and fear of Layla, who cowers underneath the table, hoping to not catch the attention of the monster. Stephen, as fascinated as he is repelled by this process, watches from above as Layla scooches around the slab, trying not to attract her attention to herself, which she, of course, promptly does by knocking into one of said canopic jars underneath the table. She then manages to right it, however, but the priest, hearing Stephen gasp and the rattling jar, gets suspicious and begins to search for both of them. In order to distract the monster, Layla then smashes one of the canopic jars against the wall, drawing his attention away from Stephen, who it had zeroed in on. Stephen tells her to run, stating that he will find her later. Shoving the table of bits and bobs off the edge and onto the monster, Stephen remarks in wondrous joy, I squished it, before then wisely deciding to exit the cenotaph. One feather for an altar giving himself credit for a bravely taken action and for overcoming the innate demands of the stress response cycle that is burned into us by the traumatic event. Fight, flight, fawn, freeze. In this case, freeze. So, good for you, Stephen. 
Fleeing from the undead priest, Layla then discovers the ubiquitous broken pathway can go no farther over a deep and deadly pit trope, and then drops a flare down to emphasize to the audience just how deep that pit actually is. Spoiler! Very. Hearing one of the priests chittering behind her, Layla now, of course, fulfills the second half of the trope, moving slowly along with footing that caves way, of course, leading to the inevitable and physically impossible final leap to safety with the priest hot on her tail, which apparently can move through walls, only to be grabbed by said priest and hauled away into the darkness. Twice! Twice! before she finally emerges after what was obviously a pitch-scratch fight, whereby the monster apparently lent her a hand involuntarily and half his arm as well. While this is not DID-related, one feather for avoiding a common trope and showing a strong female lead that doesn't inappropriately scream and actually successfully fights back. Keep this up, Marvel, please. The fight against the priest now continues with his severed arm turning from a liability into an asset and becoming a nasty weapon with all kinds of sharp, pointy bone bits. Layla once again shows us that a good stock of road flares are an absolute necessity in any Tomb Raider, uh, adventurer's kit, shoving the lit flare into one of the undead priest's eye sockets metaphorically and physically showing it the light. Taking advantage of the moment, Layla then grapples with the thing, finally throwing it into the depths along with herself, leading to our next trope, which of course we know is not going to be fatal for her, and we then get the hero manages to hold on, pull themselves up miraculously against gravity despite having a fully loaded backpack shot. Seriously, if this were us, we'd be falling to our deaths in the bottom of that pit. I guess maybe there was a purpose to the hazing ritual that was climbing that overly thick rope in elementary school gym class, after all. Nah. At least, Layla does have the good sense to scream in horror once she's safe, rather, again, than in the middle of the action. Again, weak female tropes need not apply here. At this point, our man Harrow shows up, having watched the entire thing from across the pit between them. We now cut to Steven, still attempting to find his way through the tomb and, presumably, to Layla. Rounding a corner, he comes upon the cherry on the Sunday, the sarcophagus of the pharaoh, and, again, geeks out at what he finds. And rightfully so. I mean, this place is swank. Mark, illogically choosing this moment to start an argument, decides to hound Steven about Layla. So, you kissed her, to which Steven quips, Yeah, well, what are you going to do, drown us now? Mark states that, yeah, I should, but you also told her the truth about why I've been pushing her away, and that was unexpected. Stephen really doesn't know how to reply beyond a grunt, and promptly then moves his attention to the contents of the room, eventually discovering a series of Macedonian script inscriptions and hieroglyphs that lead him to deduce that the tomb that they are in is that of none other than Alexander the Great. We're going to go ahead and award one feather for Mark first being pissed about the kiss, but then actually admitting that Stephen was right to tell Layla. At the 26-minute mark, we cut back to Harrow and Layla getting into an argument slash gaslighting manipulation session by Harrow, Ray, her father, and Mark's place in his death. Now, at this point, interestingly, Harrow makes a statement that your husband is in agony, more pain than a person can bear. Now, while this is being used as part of Hera's manipulation, this is a true statement, and it is exactly this that causes a child to associate and develop DID because of the trauma. Now, this leads to the question, does Harrow know? We'll see. Hopefully. Maybe. So we're going to go ahead and award one feather for a realistic depiction of gaslighting and manipulation, and one feather for the nod to the pain that DID and trauma survivors endure. But we have to award one heart for using this as a weapon to manipulate another person. Continuing on, Layla then tells Harrow to speak his entire piece, with him on one side of the cliff and her on the other, which is actually a very nice visual framing that emphasizes the distance, literally, between their two viewpoints. At this point, we cut to Stephen and Mark trying to convince Stephen that it's really necessary for him to open the sarcophagus. Mark asks, do you want Harrow to get to Amut first? 
at which point Stephen does comply, finally pushing aside the lid of the sarcophagus and revealing a very ornately wrapped mummy of Alexander. And may we add, the wrapping here is actually accurate. So good for you, Marvel. No feather for you, but good for you. Mark asks Stephen where the Ushapti, or the statue of Amut, is, and Stephen, reasoning it out, determines that the Ushapti is most likely inside the mummy. Apologizing profusely all the while, Stephen then unwraps the head of Alexander the Great and shoves his hand and almost his entire arm down the mummy's throat, digging around for the statue of Amut, while Mark provides encouragement of the not-so-helpful sword. We're going to give one feather for showing how alters and internal dialogue can make things more difficult than they need to be if they would just keep their mouths shut and let the host core get on with things. Not like we have any personal experience with this or anything. Moving on. We now cut back to Harrow and Layla's uh, conversation as Harrow reveals the details of her father's death at the hands of an anonymous group of mercenaries, leading Layla to then ask, and you think Mark was one of them? Harrow then smiles oily and says, You said it, not me. Now let's just stop. This is a classic piece of gaslighting and control. Harrow is now essentially taking the onus of the revelation of Mark's complicity in, or possible complicity in Layla's father's death, off of his shoulders and putting it squarely on onto Layla's. This is a nasty and completely common manipulation technique. We're going to award one feather for showing this classic manipulation tactic and for continuing to stress it, making a far more believable villain out of Harrow. At the 30 minute mark, Harrow now continues, telling Layla that Mark has all the memories of that day, taunting her with an exact description of her father's clothing. Layla then seems to swallow this down and turns to ask him, Are you done? Harrow replies, I do hope you find closure. Having finally had enough of his bullshit, Layla then turns and finally leaves. Perhaps to intimidate her, or perhaps to drive the point home, Harrow yells after her, Wake up! Before his men then inform him that they have just found another way into the tomb. One feather here for Layla showing strength enough to not only endure Harrow's manipulations, but re for recognizing what they are, and oddly, giving an excellent representation of the anger and self-doubt that gaslighting causes. We now cut back to Stephen with his arm shoved down Alexander the Great's throat as Stephen finds the Ushapti of Amut and withdraws it. Layla then enters the room, still seriously upset from Harrow's manipulations in the previous scene. Unsuspecting and holding the statue of Amu to loft, Stephen says, Layla, look, we won! Layla, however, is obviously not interested in celebrating, but instead paces around him furiously. Finally cluing into this fact, Stephen asks if she's all right. Layla then asks Stephen, can he hear me? Stephen attempts a wry joke here, thinking that perhaps she means Alexander in the sarcophagus behind her. He says, I sure hope not. This falls flat, however, when Layla directly confronts Mark. What happened to my father? I'm talking to you. To the puzzled Stephen, she states, I'm talking to you, Mark. Mark then switches in, but instead of dealing with Layla's question, he avoids and states, truthfully, that they need to get out of there now. Layla, however, is having none of this and frowns on him again, demanding to know what happened to her father. Mark again insists that they need to leave now, that they're in danger, and that he promises to explain everything to her later. We're going to award one feather for showing that once again Layla, even under extreme duress, realizes and accepts the differences between Mark and Stephen, and appropriately address again expressing that anger in the right direction, rather than simply taking it out on an easy target, Stephen. Despite her struggles, Layla has shown excellent representation of how NT advocates can bridge that gap, despite the oddity of dealing with only one body and many people in it. Books, covers, and all of that. Finally pushed to the obvious, Layla then asks Mark directly, Did you kill him? Mark angrily replies, Of course not. Of course I didn't. Not satisfied with this, Layla states flatly, But you were there. Mark, ashamedly, finally admits, I was there. 
We're going to give one feather to Mark for finally being truthful under duress despite the urge to avoid confrontation, which is yet another common response of trauma victims. At this point, Layla asks, how did he die? Mark pauses for a moment before revealing, a partner got greedy and executed everyone at the dig site. As Layla absorbs this, Mark then states, I tried to stop him. I tried to save your father and I couldn't save him. Layla turns and says, no, but you brought a killer right to him, shoving Mark. Unable to deny this, Mark finally admits responsibility and says, yeah, and he shot me too. I was supposed to die that night. I should have died. Leaning further into his newfound honesty, perhaps from Stephen's influence, he adds, I've wanted to tell you since the moment I met you. I just didn't know how. We're going to award one feather for showing alter growth through the passive and active influence of other alters. Sticking to honesty here, even and especially when he knows that it will hurt his relationship with Layla. Laughing hysterically, and understandably, Layla then states, putting it all together, Oh my god, that's the reason that we met? You just had a guilty conscience. At this point, right as Mark is going to reply, our tender scene is cut short by the sound of guns being chambered as Harrow and his men enter the chamber. Desperately looking for a way out, Mark then tells Layla, Go! Find another way out. I'll hold them off. Grabbing a ceremonial axe from the sarcophagus, Mark then readies himself to fight. Harrow and his followers then move into the chamber. Still relying on his Jedi mind tricks, uh, gaslighting and manipulation, Harrow then explains to Mark how he felt when Khonshu was gone, all the while growing nearer and nearer to Mark. Monologuing! <sighs> Explaining that freedom from Khonshu means freedom of choice as well, Harrow states the obvious that Mark has a very important choice to make right now. Mark, seeming to chew on this, says, okay. As a red shirt, uh, sorry, cultist, with a gun draws near, we can see Mark waiting to take action. As expected, Mark then begins to show exactly why you shouldn't bring a gun to a ceremonial axe fight, burying it in the chest of one of Harrow's followers after lopping off the arms of two others. In what is one of the best displays of villains actually acting sensibly, Harrow then pulls out a gun and promptly shoots Mark in the chest. As Mark staggers back, we see Layla holding her mouth looking horrified, apparently still in the room despite Mark telling her to flee. Reeling backward, Mark is then shot again by Harrow as a horrified Layla tries to be silent. The body reeling, Mark begins to fall backwards into the pool of water that surrounds the sarcophagus because every Egyptian tomb ever contained both running and standing water, really does wonders for the disintegration of, oh, say, organic tissues and things, the exact opposite of the purpose behind mummification in the first place. It does, however, provide us with this wonderfully framed shot of Mark slash Stephen spread eagled, literally mimicking the depiction of the sun god Ra behind them in the background. Is this foreshadowing, perhaps? We'll see. As Mark falls backwards into the pool, Harrow then takes his final shot, but this time with words instead of the gun. I can't save anyone who won't save themselves. As the camera pans in, we see Mark lying in the water, slowly drifting deeper into its embrace, which is perhaps a metaphor for what is about to occur. As Mark slowly sinks into the darkness and moves towards the light, proverbially and literally, we are left to ponder if this is indeed the death of Mark slash Stephen and the body that we are witnessing. That is, until we move into solid WTF territory as we fade in on what is obviously meant to be a low-budget Indiana Jones knockoff, complete with ruins, sidekick, and over-the-top hero! As we're forced to watch this Saturday afternoon schlockfest, we can see that there are similarities between it and what has happened to Mark and Stephen thus far. Or has it? And now our trip down the proverbial rabbit, or perhaps scarab hole, begins as the camera pulls back to show that indeed this schlock movie is being viewed by, you guessed it, the inmates at what seems to be a rather unusual asylum. This doesn't seem to be just any asylum, with virtually everything being white. 
were treated to a man pulling bingo balls out of a white hat, calling off the numbers to what seemed to be entirely unenthused inmates or patients, several of whom we see doing things that we have seen Stephen or Mark do previously, the Rubik's Cube being an example. Other clues are dropped, including a clock that instead of numbers appears to have cuneiform or hieratic symbols instead. We're shown a daily schedule that includes, among other things, a zoo visit at 3 p.m. right before bingo, which is where we seem to be at. One of the inmates is drawing a picture of Khonshu, if Khonshu were the bluebird of happiness, from the neck down. As the camera pans around the waiting room, we are shown yet more bizarre artwork. Is this perhaps all connected? How to score this? We do have to admit that we've been expecting Marvel to cover the Asylum trope at some point. It's a natural, low-hanging fruit. So, for this, one heart. Continuing the pan around the room, the camera finally centers on a picture of a heavily sedated Mark, sitting in front of a window with a goldfish prominently placed. At this point, Marvel, okay, we get it. You're leading us to believe that everything here is, is connected to Mark's condition and has been nothing more than spun into the fantasy that we have all been watching up to this point. The mind extrapolates, etc., 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 insert endless psychobabble here. A passing woman then tells him, we changed the movie, okay, before adding or changing pictures to the bulletin board with the odd artwork. We then see that she's a dead ringer for Layla. She then continues stating, It's been five times this week. It's a lot. Seeming to recognize her, Mark then attempts to speak through the heavy sedation. Munching what appears to be for all the world a marshmallow that she pulls off the bulletin board, we see that this Layla is also likely a patient. As she turns to Mark and asks, Did I startle you? With the white hat bingo man still calling off numbers, Marshmallow Layla then checks the card in Mark's lap, stating, Look at that! We won! Mirroring the dialogue that they had had in the tomb just minutes before. Marshmallow Layla doesn't seem interested in sharing this victory, however, holding the card aloft and stating, I won! To which white hat bingo man replies, We have a winner! Layla then turns to Mark and says, I'll share it with you this time, I swear before running off, leaving a befuddled Mark staring at his reflection in the window. Mark sees Stephen in the reflection and calls out to him, rising from his wheelchair, only to discover that he is chained to it by falling flat on his face, which again is a callback to his sleeping habits from before in the other reality. As he falls to the floor, we see that he has also been clutching a Moon Knight action figure. Ah, trademark! Hey look, you know they're going to make him sooner or later. So we're going to go ahead and give one heart here for showing Mark as being heavily sedated, implying inherent violent tendencies, which may well be the case, but there are better ways to represent this than the heavily drugged, drooling, and incoherent patient trope. Moving right along at the 40-minute mark, an orderly, who interestingly looks an awful lot like the thug who just got mummified alive, helps Mark back into the chair and states, you can't keep doing this. A befuddled Mark then stares at the action figure, which lies on the floor. And from the looks of the thing and its deformed feet, it's obvious that this is most likely a first-run Kenner action figure. Seriously, those things never stood upright. Moving on, we cut to Harrow's voice speaking to Mark, telling him, I know you're having difficulty trying to differentiate between what's real and what's in your head. As the camera pulls back, we see Harrow shoving the VHS action movie across the table, stating, I hope you don't mind, but I took the liberty of borrowing the film that you brought. It was fun to see my old VHS player still worked. As it becomes increasingly apparent that Mark is now in an administrative doctor's office, Harrow continues asking, How many times would you say you've seen that movie? As Mark begins to focus on our still blurred speaker, Dr. Harrow, spoiler, states, I liked the villain, and proceeds to mock the villain's monologue, which is very meta in this case, and as Mark looks at his surroundings with increasing interest and clarity, continues that the film makes a whole meal out of a lunar god. Didn't you say that you worked for one? Is this Harrow slipping up? We're not sure. More bits are then shown to us as Mark looks around, a painting of the town where Stephen first appeared in episode one, his jaw broken inexplicably, and then just as inexplicably repaired. Doc Harrow continues his probing. What do you make out of that similarity? 
Given the production value of that film, I don't imagine anyone else has seen it. What do you think? Now, while this may seem like an instant heart for showing that some therapists may commit actual harm during session, Harrow is hardly showing best practices here. We're actually going to award this one feather for actually having the balls to show, or at least to intimate, this problem. And we have run into this ourselves in our search for therapists. Some of them just don't connect, or they don't use best practices and can make things worse in some cases. So, moving on, Mark's vision then finally clears, revealing da 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 Doc Harrow looking concerned and waiting for his answer. Barely able to answer, Mark states that he can't think clearly. We think. He mumbles hardcore, so. Doc Harrow replies, I know, and I'm sorry about that, but remember you're only sedated because of your own behavior, and the effects will wear off soon. Now, while this does grind against the proper representation of DID, leaning into the crazy, violent patient trope, and is something that we find immensely distasteful, there is a solid reasoning behind the practice of sedation. It is a fact that this may be necessary for mental health patients, some of them, for their safety and that of others in extreme cases. Therefore, we're reluctantly calling this one a wash. In the end, no feathers and no hearts. Harrow then goes on to state, We don't live in a material world. We live in a psychic world, where we can only draw indirect influences about the nature of reality. Take, for example, this pen. To me, this is a writing utensil. As we are then shown that his office is curiously laden with Egyptian symbology and again everything being in stark white, he continues, To my dog, it's a chew toy. Both are accurate. It's just a question of context. Mark focuses in on Doc Harrow's cane, hooked against the edge of the table. Harrow continues, All I'm asking of you is an honest assessment of your situation. Mark sees Harrow's sandals from before in a reflection, and his attention is then caught by a fly that lands on his hand. Mark then repeats, Everything reminds me. Harrow then asks, Reminds you of what? Of your past? Of Stephen? Obviously taken aback, Mark asks, You know Stephen? Harrow replies, Of course I know Stephen, but I want to talk to you right now, Mark, and I have noticed in our sessions a pattern developing. At this point, we, as Mark looks around, we see a shot of a statue of this very same goat god that we referenced at the beginning of the episode, Kanum. Was this a foreshadowing? Harrow then continues, Every time I ask you direct questions, you are triggered and overwhelmed. And that's normal. As Mark's head clears and he begins to see more signs around him, Harrow continues, Many of us, when asked to look into our innermost experiences, into the nucleus of our personality, choose to close our eyes. It's understandable. Leaning forward, he repeats the last line that he spoke in the tomb. I can't help you if you don't help yourself. Ugh. As much as we hate to, we have to give one feather for Doc Harrow stating what is often true and touching upon the avoidance that trauma victims may have in dealing with their experiences. And while this whole thing smacks of toxic positivity, it is true on a certain level that ultimately it's up to the survivors to seek help. We know firsthand that this is a struggle. With everything metaphorically and physically coming into focus, Mark states, You shot me, and proceeds to try to crawl away from Doc Harrow, in the process spying three canopic jars on a shelf, specifically those meant to contain the liver, lungs, and the intestines. Curiously, there are only three jars shown out of the usual four, one jar for each of the four sons of Horus, which correspond to the four directions. The missing jar contains the stomach and was guarded by Duamutef, a jackal-headed god similar to Anubis. Foreshadowing that perhaps the gods are paying attention after all, or at least some of them? Just a side note observation. As Mark continues to vainly struggle away from Harrow, Doc Harrow states, I really do understand how you're feeling. I too have suffered from mental illness, breaks in psychic awareness, manic episodes followed by depression. I know what you're feeling and I know you can be healed. 
Wow, so much in one little sentence. Again, though we hate to admit it, Harrow is speaking truth here. Many, many mental health care workers are often survivors of trauma, led to the profession through empathy and a lack of proper care for the same conditions that they have struggled with. Our own therapist would be an excellent example of this, so one feather for that. We are less thrilled with the line about, I know you can be healed. While this may seem like an appropriate thing to say, this actually hides a great deal of toxic positivity. Setting a goalpost of being healed when dealing with a condition, in this case DID, that cannot be healed. DID is a lifetime condition that can only be managed, not cured. The damage has already been done and cannot be undone only the symptoms dealt with. So, one heart here. Mark makes it to the door of the office and shatters the glass attempting to escape, wrenching the door open and promptly being caught by two orderlies, at which point Doc Harrow asks them to be gentle with him and don't hurt him. Mark, however, is not so sanguine about the non-violent part and bites and elbows the orderlies trying to escape. Breaking free and running through the door, Mark attempts to find a way to an exit. As he does so, elements from his fantasy film life, the real one, the show that we've been watching to this point, not the VHS one, begin to bleed through. A clever, if obvious, use of primary and secondary color contrast for dramatic effect. Sorry guys, but Schindler's did it first. Good try, though. Okay, here we're going to go with one heart again for showing leaning into the violent, crazy patient trope, but this time because it's being used as a plot device and not as a representation. At 45 minutes, the hospital begins to violently rock, or is it just Mark's perceptions? With the orderlies hot on his tail, Mark finds a random room and hides inside. Momentarily safe, Mark hears a thump from within the room and turns around to find an elaborate sarcophagus, with the thudding continuing from inside. As the camera moves in, we begin to hear Stephen calling for help from the inside. Let me out! Let me out! Let me out! Mark removes the lid, revealing a very freaked out Stephen. We're then treated to the Stephen? Mark? Oh my fucking god! reaction, as they hug each other in what is obviously surprise and relief. One feather here, but we're not going to give you the reason for it just yet, as it's tied into our assessment of the entire hospital situation. Touching Embrace over, they then come to the realization that they can see and touch one another at the same time. Stephen sums it up nicely by asking, how is this possible? Mark has no idea, but instead asks Stephen what the last thing he remembers is. Stephen thinks for a moment, then states, Harrow shot us, which makes Mark literally jump for joy, finally having confirmation of what really happened. We're going to award one feather here for showing a very honest reaction by Mark, having ex received external well, sort of validation of his memories or perceptions. This is dead on with DID and dissociative conditions. A lack of perception and of perspective can make your situation very difficult to deal with. Uh, for instance, when your family or those around you begin to tell you things that you have no memory of doing or saying, it's very easy to feel like you're being gaslit when you really aren't. You just can't see it. But getting even simple validation from someone else of your thoughts or feelings or perspective can have a profound impact. So moving on, as they look for a way out together, they pass by another room from which a familiar thumping noise is coming from, you guessed it, another sarcophagus standing in the small room a spectacularly red and black sarcophagus that is rattling violently. We're going to give you one feather awarded here, but again, we'll explain why in just a minute. Despite it being blatantly apparent that there is someone in there, Mark and Stephen move on down the corridor of doors before seeing the shadow and hearing the sounds of something very large behind a set of double doors at the end of the corridor. With both Mark and Stephen looking on, the doors open to reveal a large hippo dressed in full Egyptian regalia. Understandably shocked, they stare at the hippo, who rather demurely says, Hi! Which, of course, elicts a very understandable double scream from our heroes. And end scene, and the episode. Save, of course, for the Nami link at the end. 
the very end. Again. One heart, Marvel. All right, at this point, let's go ahead and recap, and we're going to give you our theory on what we're actually seeing in the hospital. Our theory is actually that the hospital is, in fact, the headspace of Mark and Steve and that system. Now, this might seem uh, difficult to believe at first, but bear with us. If the hospital is indeed a representation of the headspace, then it answers many of the questions raised about the bizarre imagery we've seen so far. For example, the white hat bingo man are the balls that are drawn determining the next altar to front. That would then make the patients, in fact, altars waiting to front, each containing a bit of the true picture, person events, i.e. the conchu bird, the painting in Harrow's office, the Rubik's Cube, the two other altars, Stephen and the red sarcophagus, being sectioned off in the headspace until Mark, who is ostensibly the core, though this has yet to be directly confirmed, releases them. This would reinforce why Mark and Stephen chose to oddly ignore the thumping coming from inside the red sarcophagus. Perhaps they're picking up on the fact that this is a violent altar and are consciously or unconsciously sliding over the obvious conclusion that this is the violent non-co altar alluded to in episode 3. This is further emphasized by the deep red and black color scheme used, obvious psychological allusions to blood and violence. Now similarly, if they are in the headspace, this would explain why Mark and Stephen are able to physically touch and interact with each other. This hypothesis, however, does lead to some uncomfortable questions and or possibilities. For example, is Doc Harrow actually an altar gatekeeping the front? Is Marshmallow Layla actually another altar? And of course, we now have to address the hippo in the room, which is a direct representation of the goddess Tawaret, who was the goddess of pregnancy and the protector of both women and children. While in early Egyptian mythology she is depicted as being somewhat violent, and hippos actually are very powerful and frightening creatures, later Egyptian mythos portrayed her clearly as more of a mother protecting her young and a nurturing spirit, as a kind of nurse, fitting in with the asylum ward theme, who warded off evil spirits in order to protect her charges. Interestingly, in episode one, we see that the gift shop Stephen works in sells a plush hippo towerette, a nice bit of foreshadowing. And by the way, we totally want a plushy towerette. Betsy and Betsy could use a companion and maybe this will be a thing. Hey Marvel, hook us up, huh? Yeah, plushy, plushy hippo. All right, so with these facts given, it's fairly obvious that going forward, towerette is going to act as more of a helper than a hindrance, and perhaps has been protecting Mark slash the system for throughout their lives. We're not entirely sure at this point how many layers Marvel is going to add on to this or what they're going to be, so we're only guessing. As far as the theory of the hospital being the headspace, it would not be too much of a jump in logic to conclude that, as Khonshu has already done, Tawaret is able to access and appear in the headspace from the outside, thus keeping her separate and outside the system, but able to continue to protect or influence the internal landscape. So that's our theories and that's our thoughts on the episode. Let's go ahead and total up our hearts and feathers. And once again, we see that with six hearts versus 33 feathers, the scales again have swung in favor of proper representation of dissociative conditions, trauma, and DID by Marvel in the Moon Knight series. You're doing a good job so far, Marvel. Keep it up, because we're going to be watching and reviewing you. That's it for this time, guys. We'll see you next time when we review Episode 5 of Moon Knight and see what Marvel has in store for us. We'd like to thank you for watching and subscribing, and go ahead and hit us up in the comments section below with your thoughts on Moon Knight, this particular episode, the series in general, DID, or whatever you'd like to chat about. We'd like to thank all of our new viewers and subscribers again, and remind all of you, as always, to remember that you are loved, that you are strong, and that you are not alone. I'm Chris. Thanks for watching.